morning and I know it's an hour later than usual, but um, you know, as you know, it's a little bit complicated when Rohan runs the series and we have a toddler. Um, uh, so today I'll be talking a little bit about using Facebook advertising data to estimate migration. Um, I will do that. Uh, before I start, I just want to apologise. Um, I made these uh, 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 slides very quickly. Um, and I think that like I'm all for really, really good aesthetically pleasing slides. Um, and so in my head, I always want to like use Sagarin or however you say it, or like use, um, you know, some fancy like HTML um, and go all Charlotte and be fancy. This is both, oh, what am I doing? These, these are both from Charlotte's previous uh, presentations that I stole off her website. But in reality, I run out of time and I'm left with uh, the default theme in Beamer. So I'm really sorry that the slides look really boring. Um, I hope the presentation content is more interesting than how the slides look. Um, okay, so I'm getting people popping up, so I'm just going to move that. Okay, so a little bit about me. Rohan sort of introduced me because obviously he knows me quite well. Um, I struggle to know what to call myself. I, I guess first and foremost, I'm a demographer, but um, my day-to-day -day research, I'm really an applied statistician um, looking at different statistical methods to, pro to solve data problems. I'm also interested in social problems, so I'm a bit of a social scientist. Um, I could keep going with all these labels, but um, you know, I think I'm firmly an interdisciplinary scientist, and I think a lot of us here are, and that's why the Toronto Data Workshop is so good. It sort of brings us all together because we're all a bit of bit of everything. Um, but uh, so my research in general, I'm I'm mostly interested in um, problems in demographic estimation when when the data are, are noisy or or sparse or or so we don't have much data or the data that we do have is not very good. Um, and as you've probably realized, I'm not Canadian. Um, Rohan and I are both Australian. Uh, we moved to um, uh, North America seven years ago and we've been in Canada for, for two and a half years. Okay. Okay, so given that I'm not talking to a demographic audience, al although I did recognise quite a few names popping up, there are quite a few demographers in this audience, um, I just thought I'd give you a little bit of a crash course in demography for everyone else. Um, so what is demography? Um, at a very broad level, we're interested in studying population processes um, and how populations change over time. So we're interested in individuals and in, in people, but only in the sense that they they're the individual units that make up an aggregate um, when you when you sum them all together and, and um, you have a population. So in particular, we're interested in population change. So whether that's um, structural changes, such as like changes in the age distribution, for example, um, changes in growth rate, um, changes in the spatial distribution of populations, um, changes over time, and how these population level changes um, are associated with or intertwined with um, broad, more broader changes in society, um, in the economy and health and welfare. Um, so at a very sort of fundamental level, demographers are interested in population change. So how can a population change? One of four ways. We can be born, we can die, um, we can um, have people move into a population in a particular area that we're interested in, or people can move out. So we can have in or out migration. And there's no other way that we can create or get rid of people. So it's fairly, you know, um, fairly matter of fact in that sense. And in fact, we can write down a very simple equation that we call the demographic accounting identity. And what this says is um, the population next year is equal to the population uh, this year, plus the people who are born, minus the people who die plus the number of in migrants minus the number of out migrants. Okay, so this has to hold in theory. There's no other way, as I said, there's no other way we can um, move, uh, get, um, add people or, or, or get rid of people. Um, so in essence, demography is very simple. It's, and, and if we, 
if we had data on every single one of these components, um, the, the, the sort of study of formal demography would just be a purely account, like an accounting exercise, right? We would just sort of add things and take away things and, and divide things through to get proportional change and all that things all that sort of thing. And, but, the, but the sort of interesting thing about demographic problems, and this is where statistics comes in, is that we usually don't have data on all these components, or if we do, we don't have um, very good data. Or we, or we might have data that sort of, you know, doesn't agree with each other. So the left-hand side doesn't actually equal the right-hand side. There's, there's, another, there's another term on the right-hand side that's missing. It's a big plus error. Right, and so the plus error is, you know, statisticians were all about error, and so that's where sort of using statistical method comes in. Um, so in terms of like thinking about births and deaths, for example, in Canada and in most high income countries, um, the main sources of information on births and deaths come from vital registration systems, right? So in Canada, when you're born, you get a, a birth certificate, you're registered in the system for the whole of Canada, your birth is registered um, and the same with your death. So these sorts of um, national level um, registration systems, um, as I said, exist in a lot of high income countries, but they don't exist in a lot of um, low income countries. And, and um, if they do exist, they may not actually cover the whole population. Um, so just sort of looking at this at a very at sort of the global level, um, this map shows sort of the coverage of vital registration systems in terms of picking up the proportion of deaths in a particular population. So the dark blue colours here are the countries where we have 100% registration of deaths. Um, so Canada, the US, um, Australia, New Zealand, a lot of um, Western Europe. But then as the, as the blue color gets lighter and lighter, that's sort of suggesting we have um, less and less coverage of our, the, the number of um, deaths that actually happen. And this lightest blue color is where we have no vital registration systems at all. And so you can see that in the large majority of Sub-Saharan Africa, um, we don't have any vital registration systems at all. Um, so we sort of have to rely on these sort of other weird imperfect source data sources to try and understand um, patterns in death. Um, and it's sort of a double whammy because um, the burden of mortality and the health burden um, is also the highest in these low income countries. So mortality rates are sort of, you know, up to a hundred times as high for some age groups um, in sub-Saharan Africa compared to places like Canada. Um, and, and this sort of, this sort of issue really hits home a key issue in demography, but also a key issue, I would argue, for the whole of quantitative social science, is that whenever you're thinking about a problem in society, um, usually the data quality and availability is the worst for those subpopulations who are the most disadvantaged, right? So we're, you know, as sort of social scientists, as sort of good citizens, perhaps we're interested in trying to help those who are, um, the, the worst off, but the problem is we, we often have the least information about those people. Um, and, you know, the, the global death registration thing, that was a very macro level example, but it sort of also holds true at a micro level. So thinking about, you know, trying to survey people um, about income, about financial stress, it's going to be harder to reach um, people of a low income who might have um, more tenuous sort of housing situations, more tenuous, you know, working multiple jobs um, than higher income. So it sort of works on all different scales. <clears throat> okay, so that was sort of off topic, but you know, general audience, I thought I'd give a general introduction. So um, focusing now on the migration component of population change. Um, I said that often we don't have good data on births and deaths, but it's even worse um, in the case of migration. So thinking about um, different measures of migration, it's really important to try and understand how migration is changing over time. Migration affects population composition at the very sort of fundamental level, but it also has substantial economic, social and cultural consequences. And perhaps um, unlike the other components of population change, um, it can happen really quickly. So forced migration due to war and conflict, 
um, or um, due to natural disasters such as a hurricane, for example. And so in order to understand these patterns over time, we have to have really good estimates and an idea on how sure we are about those estimates. <coughs> um, okay. Right, so, but then, so it's really important to try and measure migration, but it's also really hard in general. Um, the first reason it's hard is because of these definitional issues. With births and deaths, it's pretty clear when someone's born and when someone dies, but it's less clear when someone migrates, right? It depends on the context. It depends on what you're interested in. You know, are you interested in international migration or internal migration? Um, you know, if you move somewhere for a month and then go back again, are you a migrant? Maybe not, but if you move, you know, for six months, are you a migrant? You know, it, it sort of depends on the context. And so it, as soon as you get definitional changes, it, it's hard to sort of collect that good data. Um, um, good quality detailed data often just don't exist, particularly for low income countries, um, but even in um, higher income countries as well, particularly if you've got um, land borders, for example. Um, and as sort of Rohan alluded to in the introduction, even if we do have good quality data, the release of that data in sort of the public sphere, sphere particularly micro level data is often really delayed. And so, um, you know, you're interested in migration that's happening right now, but you might have to wait, you know, one to two years to get data, official sort of data on, on those migration uh, patterns. Okay, so when we think about traditional data sources of migration, um, censuses and surveys are the two really big ones. So often in, um, in censuses and also sort of annual um, labour force surveys and things like that, um, questions would be, you know, where did you live a year ago? Where did you live five years ago? Um, other questions like um, asking about your citizenship, asking about your birthplace, um, those things. Um, although in particular, the citizenship question is, is a little bit controversial. Um, those, those sorts of questions can be used to try and sort of infer migration flows. Um, and the other sort of traditional data source is government and administrative data. So, you know, the government has a record of um, everyone that comes in, um, uh, but it's often sort of presented in this way of um, you know how many are how many are refugees, how many are PR, how many are temporary work visas. It's often sort of in a very legal um, uh, visa representation. Um, so th these sort of data sources are usually really good quality and really representative, but they're often quite delayed, or often they don't have the the level of granularity that we might be interested in. Um, we can then sort of think about using these non-traditional data sources to try and sort of complement, to try and supplement what we know from traditional data sources. So um, quite a common one in migration research is to look at tax file records because um, they don't really lie in terms of um, where people reside. The problem with those is they're, they're even more delayed and they're actually quite difficult to get, um, to get hands on as well. Only a select few researchers often have access to these types of things. Um, school enrolments is another one. So looking at um, increases or decreases in um, where people uh, are, are being enrolled in school. Cell phone data, again, using sort of GPS signals um, gives really um, fine grained um, movements, often used for, um, you see a lot of um, infectious disease mobility studies using cell phone data to try and understand how diseases spread and how quickly they're going to spread. Um, cell phone data, again, is very difficult to get your hands on unless you're part of a big sort of research group that has an understanding with a particular cell phone company. Um, and so sort of all these sorts of things, there's now this sort of, you know, large potential data source online through people um, using social media data. So that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, so, um, so, you know, I think that we all, we're all sort of aware of like these digital trace data, we're all sort of on social media, well, I'm assuming we're all on social media. Um, we sort of, um, 
use it to varying degrees. We put varying degrees of information on there, but there's sort of a lot of information that's potentially available through these data sources. Um, um, you can think of a population of social media users as, as, as their own population. So people are born into it. Um, you know, when you sign up, people die when, when they delete their account or when, I guess, when they actually die as well. And then within all those sorts of, um, there's all these sorts of movements within that population. And you can potentially get information on people's age, sex, education, mobility, all that sort of thing. And the nice thing about social media data is that it's essentially updated in real time. If we can get access to the data, we can potentially track um, movements, changes in real time, which is sort of a, a disadvantage of the traditional data sources. But there are obvious issues. Um, so, you know, I guess the big one is that we know that the, 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 the the population of users of a social media website, whether it be Facebook or Twitter or TikTok or whatever, they're not usually, excuse me, they're not generally going to be representative of the broader population that we're interested in trying to get estimates for. And some subgroups of the population may be vastly underrepresented, vastly overrepresented, or just don't even exist. Um, access to the data is also a concern. Um, I don't work at Facebook. I have absolutely no intention of ever, ever working at Facebook if I ever decide <laughs> to do that because they're offering me an enormous amount of money. Please tell me not to. Um, um, and so, you know, and they're, and they're a business, right? They're, they're interested in, in making profit. And so access to data, data is a very valuable thing these days. So getting access to that data is probably not very easy. Um, and even if we had access, it's not necessarily good, right? We don't want to be using individual level data for something that the individuals didn't um, intend it to be used for. And, and, you know, that obviously came to a head, um, I guess it was what, three or four years ago now with Cambridge Analytica. Um, and then there's a, there's a sort of a quality issue, right? So a lot of what's reported on Facebook and other social media data is self-reported. We might have missing information. We might have, uh, you know, the, the locations that are reported might be sort of particularly biased or particularly biased towards different locations and that sort of thing. Um, and so the rest of this talk, um, I, I probably rabbited on for half my time already, but the rest of this talk will be sort of introducing you to the idea of using social media advertising data um, in this sort of mi uh, migration research, how do, what is it? How do we collect it? How can we potentially use it for migration estimation? And then finishing off with an example um, where we used um, the Facebook ads data to measure out migration from Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria. Okay, so what's the problem with social um, media data? We, as I said before, um, we don't, have access to individual level data, it's not publicly available. But um, for, for sort of migration problems for demographic estimation, we don't necessarily need individual level data. I said before, demographers are usually just interested in individuals as they pertain to be a sum of a broader population. So what we want is sort of um, key population counts by key subgroups, right? Um, so the nice thing about social media um, websites is most of them have advertising platforms and we can, and most of these advertising platforms have APIs. And so we can extract information about um, the key demographic of users um, based on these advertising platforms. So um, I'll be talking about using Facebook data for this purpose, but um, a lot of the other platforms too have very, very similar set up. So LinkedIn is a big one. Um, Twitter, Instagram is very similar to Facebook for obvious reasons. Um, and then I just recently saw on Twitter that someone's made an R package to get TikTok data. So that's, that's exciting. And I don't know what that data is. I don't know anything about TikTok, so, except that very young and hip people use it. And sometimes Sharla. Sharla, do you still have a TikTok account? Um, okay, so 
this is uh, a screenshot of my, whoop, this is a screenshot of my Facebook from, it's actually a number of years ago now, I took this screenshot with the ad blocker off um, just after we moved to Canada. I think we'd, we'd been in Canada a couple of weeks. And so I wanted to show you this because um, when you actually view things with, uh, without the ad blocker on, which I don't often do, um, there's a huge amount of the web page real estate being taken up by ads. Um, and all of them are, are sort of targeted, right? So there's a McDonald's Canada. Um, there's a Canadian PayPal thing on the right here. And then this, this inner circle artworks tower was actually a new apartment block that was being built just near the U of T campus. Um, and so these are very sort of personal ads, right? So Facebook obviously knows I'm in Canada um, um, and has had a pretty good guess of um, where I live, my age and probably my income bracket. Now, um, I haven't really used Facebook very much for a long, long time. And I'm pretty sure my, my self-reported location on Facebook still says Hobart, Tasmania. Um, and so Facebook is, these ads are being targeted to me based on my, you know, location, age, education, income, whatever, but I'm not, that's not, none of that self-reported. It's all sort of um, inferred based on IP addresses and based on, you know, who my friends are and all that sort of thing. Okay, so we have these ads. Well, how are these ads placed on Facebook? So anyone can, anyone with a Facebook account can place an ad on Facebook. Um, you do it through um, a website called it's facebook.com slash business. Um, and it's sort of this advertising platform where you can go through the process of designing an ad and then targeting that ad and then putting it on Facebook. So the last step you have to pay money, but the whole process of designing and, and targeting, it's all sort of free. And so as part of that targeting um, piece, you get to target your ad to a particular audience, right? So this is a screenshot of the advertising platform. I'm making up this fictitious ad and I wanna um, target my ad to Australians who live in Toronto. Um, yeah, and that's actually, that's all the filtering I have on, but you can also target that sort of age group, um, um, education, that sort of thing. And so you can see that once I've sort of done this targeting, it gives me this number down the bottom of the screen here. It says my potential audience size is just over 4,000 people. Now the key here is that that's a data point. It's, it's an observation, it's an estimate of the number of Australians who live in Toronto. It's not a very good um, estimate, but it's an estimate all the same, right? And so the idea of collecting this data is that we can define the demographic um, subgroups that are interested in including migrant groups and iterate through all those different subgroups and extract this number um, essentially for all those groups. And then we can repeat that whenever we like. And so we can build up sort of a longitudinal data set of observations of um, migrants. Um, you don't have to do that by hand. You don't have to hire a, 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 an army of, of undergraduates to try and um, do that for you. Um, as I said before, um, the advertising platform has an API, which is, allows you to basically code um, program, program, program grammatically, sorry, I was struggling with that word, um, pull out this information. So, you know, reducing human error and, and also the time it takes to get this info. Um, and so, right, so, and you can do this in either R or Python um, and, we can sort of potentially get data on um, any sort of um, key demographic group we're interested in. So there's a lot of different information um, that you can filter by because, you know, people pay for these ads and so they want a really, like this is part of Facebook service that they, they allow you to really target your ad to a specific type of person. Okay, so, and this is sort of an example of a really this was an early iteration of this work, what the database looked like. So we sort of, you know, extract all the data using a script in R or Python and then save it all to a CSV. 
And so here you can see that we've got, um, this is for every state in the US and then all these different um, migrant groups, um, different genders, and then um, the sort of estimate of the size of the population, estimate of the denominator, and then we've got different waves, so wave one, wave two, of different collection waves. Okay. Um, so, so the next question is, okay, we can collect this data. How can we potentially use it to um, um, study migration or get estimates of different migration indicators? Um, so um, we can collect information of, so that, so the sort of example that I showed before was collecting information on migrant stocks. So the, so the number of migrants in a particular place at a particular time. If we um, do that over and over again, and then look at the difference between time points, we can get an estimate of migrant flows. Um, and then there's sort of different settings that allow you to look at um, shorter term mobility patterns and, um, and that sort of thing. So the key that I just wanna sort of illustrate in a couple of graphs now is that we know that this, these data are wrong. We know that they're biased in a lot of ways, but actually surprisingly, um, they show quite strong correlations with um, data that we know is, is reasonably good quality. Um, so th this is an example um, of data collected in, in Canada. Um, so um, so every, every dot um, on this scatter plot represents a different um, age group in a different province. Um, and the, on the y-axis here we have the proportion of migrants as reported in the census um, and it would be the 2011 census probably. I can't remember what census, some census and then on the x-axis we have the, the sort of equivalent of proportion in, in the Facebook data. And so you can see that there's a very strong positive correlation. This dotted line is the x equals y line. So if, if the dots fall on this line then the proportions are exactly the same in each data source, right? So there's obviously a lot of noise around that X equals Y line, but um, there's a pretty strong correlation, which is kind of nice, right? It means that we can potentially model this. Um, next example, um, and this is, this, this data and these graphs are courtesy of, of Michael Chong, who you, who you um, heard speak last week or a couple of weeks ago. I don't, I've forgotten weeks time. Um, and to quote Michael, he, he collects this almost every day. Um, and so this is looking at people who were recently traveling in different US states and Can Can Canadian provinces, um, starting collection, I think it was about the 13th of March, going up to probably yesterday or sometime. And so you can see that it's quite interesting, right? So um, DC, as soon as the pandemic hit, you see this huge, huge drop off in the number of people that were traveling in DC. DC is a very expat, you know, there's lots of expats in DC. There's a lot of um, sort of international corporations it's sort of been creeping up a little bit, but recently going back down again as the second wave hits. And then in North Dakota, we see a, a, a little bit of a different pattern. Remember North Dakota has been wasn't really hit in the first wave, but is now really quite suffering quite badly. And so sort of initial decrease, but then the more recent decrease is actually going below those initial levels. So, you know, this is quite interesting that we're picking up these mobility patterns just from the advertising data. Um, and then a final example is um, looking at Mex um, stocks of a particular migrant group. So in this case, Mexicans. Um, this is a terrible graph, sorry for all the data visualization people in the audience, um, but every box is a US state. Um, and this is the proportion of Mexican migrants by age group, I think it's males. Um, the blue line is the Facebook data and the red line is ACS data. So ACS is the American Community Survey, which is run every, um, every year as a supplement to um, the census. So it's like a nationally representative survey, really good quality. So you can see that, um, you know, in general, there's differences in the two 
data sources, but those differences are pretty similar across the states, right? So in general, the proportion um, of migrants is higher um, in, in the Facebook data for lower age groups, which is sort of what we expect. Um, and then the discrepancies get larger the old, for the older populations, right? But this is sort of true, you know, give or take across the board. And so there's biases, but these biases are systematic, which means, you know, we like systematic biases because it means that we can model them. Okay, so this is sort of all very promising. Um, I should hurry up. Okay, so the takeaways here is that we know the Facebook ads data is not perfect. We know that. We know that it's not great. We know that it's got representation issues, but actually perhaps surprisingly, it surprises me anyway, um, that it has quite strong correlations with good quality data in a lot of contexts. And so that suggests that we can use this data for, to try and supplement migration estimation, but we kind of have to think about how best to use them um, and how we can sort of implement statistical models to try and use them. Um, I've put two example papers using these types of data up on the screen. The first one um, has a like a bit of a Bayesian hierarchical model going on to sort of forecast migrant stocks. Um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, go for it. Um, the example that I'm going to try and quickly talk about now um, is estimating um, out migration from Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria. Okay, so by way of background, a few years ago, you probably remember, there was an, um, an enormous hurricane that devastated um, Southeast um, continental US, but in particular, um, Puerto Rico and, 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 and a lot of uh, the, the Virgin Islands, for example, um, and thousands and thousands of people moved out of Puerto Rico, um, basically straight away to try and avoid the hurricane. Um, and so the question, you know, this is a really, really short term migration event. It's, it's, it was enormous, a substantial number of people moved. It was um, immediate. And so the question is like, where did they move to and who were they? You know, was it representative of the broad, broad population or was it sort of um, more likely to be different types of people? And these types of questions are important for both Puerto Puerto Rico and also the receiving locations in terms of, um, you know, urban planning and um, health policy planning and that sort of thing. Um, but the problem is, you know, we don't, we're interested in trying to get at these things, you know, in the moment, right? But there's no data. There's no data from official sources. Um, there's, there's actually very little data, um, official data anyway at the monthly level from people moving st um, from state to state or from Puerto Rico to continental US. Um, and even if we did sort of have absolute numbers, there's, there's usually no information on the types of people that moved. Um, you can get, so now, you know, a few years on, we have these sorts of estimates of changes in migrant stocks from the ACS, that American Community Survey that I mentioned. But there, you know, we had to wait like two years for the public micro level data to come up on if it was to look at that. But it just so happened that um, we'd, around the time of Hurricane Maria, we'd been collecting this Facebook data. And so we had um, um, th these types of data before the hurricane and after the hurricane. So the question is, how can we use this to try and get an, um, an idea of what's going on? Um, um, there's a typo there, but basically, we had waves of data every two to three months and we actually had a wave collected um, just before the hurricane in September 2017 and then we had another one um, about three months later beginning um, in January 2018 and we had information on the number of Puerto Ricans by age, sex and where they were in, continent, in, in the continental US. So um, if we look at the change before and after the hurricane the change in the in the number of people by state this gives us some sort of an estimate of the of the short term sort of movement um, following the hurricane um, and the and the nice thing about the Facebook data is that we had information um, on some sort of key demographics of interest um, so 
uh, you saw before that the the Facebook data that we collect are numbers. So we have, like, for example, we know according to Facebook ads data, we know the number of Puerto Ricans aged 15 to 25 in Florida. And so if we look at that number and the difference between two pine points, that gives us an estimate of the change in the number of the change in the flow, right? The change in the number of um, migrants from wave to wave. But we don't believe that number is the, is the actual number of people that moved, right? So the question is, how do we use this data to try and get a better estimate of the number of people that moved? Um, so we might not believe the change in the number, but we might believe the relative proportional change um, in the number of migrants um, before and after the hurricane um, compared to some sort of reference category, compared to a baseline category, okay? So you can think of, you know, proportional changes over time for Puerto Rican migrants and other migrants. And if they're sort of moving in tandem before the hurricane, and then the hurricane hits and suddenly those movements diverge, then it seems reasonable to assume that the difference in those relative changes is due to the hurricane because the hurricane only affected um, um, Puerto Rican migrants. So that's what we did. This is a fairly common technique called um, difference in differences. Um, and so this allows us to sort of get an estimate for the proportional change in, in Puerto Rican migrants by sort of state and age sex. And then once we have those um, proportional changes, we can multiply those proportions by um, a population that we have um, based on a more reliable source to get the changes in the numbers. Okay. Um, so this is just sort of putting those down in, in a couple of equations. So the first um, step to get these proportional changes was to calculate this is the difference in differences um, in the proportional changes. So this sort of first group here is the Puerto Rican migrants. The second group here is the baseline group, which is which was every every um, migrant group that we had info on except for uh, Mexican migrants because they um, you know, are, are, are a little bit different, um, particularly around that time with all the sort of political stuff that was going on. Um, and then once we had this estimate of the proportional change, we could then just, you know, simply get the, the, um, um, an estimate of the number by multiplying the proportion by a number from the ACS. Okay, and then this is just a graph showing a little bit of the results. So, I mentioned that sort of we had that first wave, but we also had sub subsequent waves, right? So we could look at return migration. And so in the, the first column here, we have the sort of um, the out migration that happened. Um, so the largest out migration happened to Florida, um, Connecticut and Pennsylvania, which seem a little bit weird, but these states actually have reasonably large um, populations of Puerto Rican migrants to begin with. Um, and then you can see sort of some differing trends based on three months after that, who sort of was returning and who was not. Um, but overall, there was a 17% increase in the number of Puerto Ricans present in the US over that first three year, uh, three month period. So that um, corresponded to over 185,000 people migrating out of Puerto Rico, uh, which is like, a crazy, but I can't, I can't remember. I think it's like, like maybe two or three percent of the total population migrated. Um, and then another thing I didn't show a graph was that we saw disproportionately larger increases in the younger working age groups, but also for men compared to women. So there was sort of this, you know, a greater representation of the younger males moving out compared to everyone else. Um, and these results were sort of, you know, a lot of people were trying to trying to get estimates of, of this at the time and, and our, our results were sort of comparable to a whole range of other data sources, including flight, the flights data, cell phone data and school enrollments as well. <coughs> okay, so I'm going to wrap up. I'm almost done. So in, just to summarise, I think that data um, from social media, such as Facebook, surprisingly to me, I'm still sort of getting my head around this actually, you know, has potential to be used um, 
to produce timely um, estimates of migrations and, and potentially other types of demographic um, social indicators as well. The strength is that you can essentially collect it whenever you want and you get really big sample sizes, but it's obviously difficult to work with because there's large biases and non-representativeness. Um, we have all these new data sources. I mean, social media data is just one. There's obviously, you know, a whole bunch of other interesting data sources out there. They're often really, really large sample sizes. Um, and so you get really excited about, oh, you know, we have this new data source that we can potentially solve well, all our problems with. Um, new data sources usually don't solve the problems, they create more problems. Um, but they sort of offer new opportunities to rethink our existing methods, come up with new methods to try and improve estimates of um, social indicators and also forecasts. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening.